Hi everyone, it's Editing Beth here. Just before we dive into this video, I firstly want to apologize. It's very long. Apparently I can really talk when I want to. Maybe I should start a podcast. I don't know. But yeah, it's very long. So sorry about that. I also wanted to hazard just a slight trigger warning. Uh, this is the story of my daughter Amelia's birth and it was not very straightforward. It was a little traumatic at times and so if you are not looking to listen to a slightly traumatic birth story, maybe don't watch this video. And I also did include a couple of pictures, just, you know, little moments, little snapshots along the way. I, I don't think anything is too graphic, but there are a couple of pictures that are, I guess, pretty raw. So uh, if, if you're going to be freaked out by that, I just wanted to give a bit of a trigger warning about that as well. There's nothing, there's nothing too bad, I promise, <laughs> but just wanted to throw it out there. Anyway, I'm going to shut up. Please enjoy the video. Put this on in the background while you do something fun and I'll, I'll see you guys later. Hello everyone on the internet, YouTube. Welcome back to my channel. I am Tianit Beth and uh, today I am finally sitting down to record and a big chit chat video with all of you, my good friends and YouTube family to tell you all about my daughter, Amelia and her birth and how that all happened. I did put up a community post if you saw it uh, not a couple days after she was born to say that she was here. She came rather unexpectedly by emergency cesarean section on Friday the 1st of December. Today is Tuesday the 19th of December so it's been two and a half sort of coming up on three weeks since she was born and I did mean to sit down and record this video a lot earlier for you all but things have just been really chaotic uh, in this household. <laughs> since since everything happened so apologies it's taken me a little bit longer than anticipated so uh, make sure you got a nice hot cup of tea ready for today's video it is just gonna be this kind of like sit down chit chat vibe uh so if this is something you're interested in yeah stay tuned if this is something you're not interested in if you're only on my channel for the sims content Feel free to just skip this video because we're just going to be talking about babies and, and birth stories. So our birth story started on Friday the 1st of December. Uh, it was a regular day. I was 39 weeks and one day pregnant. So I was full term, um, it, hoping to go into labor sort of any day in the next week or so. Um, to that end, I was doing prenatal yoga every morning. So I started my day with some labor inducing prenatal yoga and I bounced on my birth ball a little bit. Um, it was it was a fairly standard, fairly busy day of just looking after my toddler who keeps me on my toes for sure. Um, I was also kind of looking after my husband that day as well. <laughs> he'd had food poisoning, poor thing, that week on the on the Monday, Tuesday, he'd come down with food poisoning. So he was still a little bit iffy on Friday. Um, he, his tummy was still not quite right. But yeah, it was just an average day. I was just running after my toddler all day. Uh, we went for a family walk in the afternoon. Nothing, nothing out of the ordinary, nothing crazy. Uh, at about five o'clock on Friday night, I, I sort of realized, oh, I haven't really um, felt my daughter moving very much inside my belly today. Now, in and of itself, this is not a huge deal because I haven't really been focusing on on whether or not Emmy was moving a lot in my in my womb that day. When you are full term pregnant and particularly, you know, in those last few weeks, you are sort of encouraged to occasionally check in and do, you know, some kick counting or some movement checks uh, for your unborn baby just to make sure that, you know, they're moving and they're happy and, and all is well. Um, and the way kick counting works is you basically you just lie down, you have a you have a nice rest and you just focus in on bubs inside the belly and make sure you can feel at least 10 movements within an hour or thereabouts. Um, so uh, about five o'clock, I was like, oh, yeah, I haven't really you know, been paying attention today because I've been busy. I'm going to lie down on the couch. I'm going to just check in, make sure she's all good. And then, you know, I was thinking Bob's your uncle will be good to go. <laughs> so I lay down on the couch for almost an hour. Um, I put on the TV for my son. I just relaxed and I couldn't feel anything. I didn't feel any kicks. I didn't feel any movement whatsoever. So I thought, okay, well, that's a little unusual. I'm, I've got to get up and make my son dinner right now. So I got up, I had a glass of orange juice, like watered down orange juice, which is sort of the advice that's generally given with kick counting. If you don't feel any movement at, in that first hour, you know, get up, move around, have something sweet to drink or something cold to drink, maybe have something to eat and then try again. So I got up, I gave Aiden his dinner um, and I had a glass of orange juice and then I lay back down to try again, see if I could feel any movement. Uh, I lay down that time for about 45 minutes or so and I didn't feel anything again. 
Um, and then it was about 6.45 p.m., about, yeah, coming up on 7 p.m., and that is the time of day that uh, my son goes into the bath and goes to bed. So I was like, okay, well, I've got to get up again. <laughs> got to put my son through the bath and to bed. I had sent my husband out to pick up some dinner for me. As I said, he had a funny tummy, so he wasn't hungry. It was Friday night. I didn't feel like cooking. I was like, can you please go pick up a schnitzel from the pub? <laughs> Thank you. So he went and did that. I got my son to bed and... I had meant, I did mention to him before he left, I was like, oh, just to let you know, like, I'm a bit concerned, like, I haven't really felt Emmy move much today, I'm, I'm trying to feel some movement, but just FYI, like, I haven't felt anything so far, and he was like, oh, okay. Got my son to bed, um, Paul came home with my dinner, I ate my dinner, and I went and lay down in my bed um, to, again, try and see if I could feel it from my my baby and once again I couldn't feel any kicks any movements whatsoever so by this stage I was starting to get pretty concerned uh it had been you know close to three hours or coming up on three hours at that point that I'd been trying to feel movement and so at that point I asked my husband to make me a hot chocolate just as like a last ditch effort because usually when I would drink a hot chocolate my baby inside my womb would just go ben mental Aiden was the same when he was inside me but hot chocolate would just make them go wee hot chocolate yummy um so I got, I got Paul to make me a mug of that I had a couple of sips and still nothing so at that point I was starting to get stressed my husband was laying beside me trying to feel movement as well he couldn't feel anything and so he sort of said do you think we should call the hospital um and I was like yeah maybe I don't know I don't want to I said to him, I'm like, I don't want to make a mountain out of a molehill. I don't know if this is, you know, nothing at this point or if this is something. I just, I don't know what's happening. So I, I don't know. And I hate making phone calls. Uh, I have social anxiety and in particular making phone calls really stresses me out. So in the end, he was like, I'll call them. I'll call them for you. I'll call them and see what they say. And I was like, thanks, honey. <laughs> gotta, gotta have a husband who makes you phone calls for you. So he rang the uh, maternity department at my local hospital and spoke to them for me and we I sort of spoke through him as well and they basically said at this point it was probably a good idea if I could come up uh, for monitoring what that would mean is just driving up to the hospital they would, they would put a heart rate and movement monitor on my belly and monitor me um, to make sure everything was okay with bubs so they said it's probably a good idea for you to come up if you want to you could give it another hour and then if you still haven't felt anything come up later or you could just come up now um, it's kind of up to you and I looked at Paul and I was like what do you think and he said well if it's no big deal for them to just pop a monitor on you and make sure everything's okay you might as well just go now you know just get that peace of mind and I was like yeah no that's a good call it was almost eight o'clock at night at that point and I thought I'd rather go then than wait another hour and then go at like 9 p.m because I'm <laughs> I'm old and tired I have a toddler so 9 p.m is like bedtime for us usually so I was like no I'll go now um and I'll I'll, I'll get everything checked out so I put my hospital bag in the car. I didn't even bother to put my daughter's hospital bag in the car. We did have them packed and we had the car seat installed and everything was ready to go for labor and everything. But I was like, it's probably nothing. I'm probably just gonna go. They're probably gonna be like, everything's fine. And then send me back home. So whatever, no big deal. So I drove up to the hospital, uh, which is about a 25 minute drive from my house. So I got there about half past 8 p.m. ish. Um, I was seen straight away by the midwives. So in Australia, let me just explain for those of you overseas, because I know it's a bit different. In Australia, maternity wards are staffed primarily by midwives, trained midwives who are, uh, have all done, you know, like three year degrees, have lots of experience. They are like a, a well-recognized and respected medical professional, kind of akin to a nurse. It's just like a, it's like a nursing degree, which specializes in, you know, childbirth and, and infant and all things related to that. So maternity wards, um, and in particular at my local hospital, they're staffed primarily by midwives. And then because my local hospital is a rural hospital, um, well, considered like semi-rural, there's often actually not a doctor um, on site at all times, but we have doctors on call at all times. So when I got there Friday night, 8.30 p.m., there was no doctor there. There were plenty of midwives, but no doctor um, was there at the time, just to let you know that that's sort of how, how things work in Australia. So I got there. I was seen straight away by the midwives. They showed me into one of the, like, uh, clinic rooms where they where they do, like, day daytime visits and stuff. They popped a heart rate monitor on my belly, and right away we could hear Emmy's heart beating um, and, you know, got a really good signal and... 
I was kind of like, oh, okay, she's fine. Whew, everything's fine. Messaged my husband. I'm like, Emmy's fine. She's she's happy. And the midwife even said, yeah, she's a happy little camper in there. Heart, heart rate sounds great. She's probably just having a big sleep or something. Maybe she's even getting ready for labor, you know, within the next day or two. And I was like, oh, maybe. So everything seemed to be fine. However, um, so the, the standard practice is for about 20 or 30 minutes, they'll leave you hooked up to the monitor. Um, there's a machine printing out like an ECG reading next to you. And um, if everything's well after sort of 20, 30 minutes, usually they just take the monitor off and off you go back home. So that's what I was thinking was going to happen. However, after sort of 20 minutes had passed, the midwife looked at the ECG readout and sort of said, mm, it's, it's, it's a bit odd. Her heart rate's fine, but it's just a bit odd. We're just, I think I'll leave you hooked up for a little bit more. I can't, it looks like your, your baby's having a really big sleep. We just need her to wake up and sort of wriggle around a bit. I was kind of like, okay. <laughs> so she got me to lay on one side for 10 minutes and then lay on the other side for 10 minutes and sort of try to just wiggle around a bit. Um, I think we like wiggled my belly around a bit. We were trying to um, get Emmy to wake up and yeah, just kick and, and move around a bit in, in there because basically what was happening was her heart rate was fine, but it was almost too stable. So a healthy heart rate, particularly for an infant inside the womb, has a lot of like variation in it. So it'll have like accelerations and decelerations, uh, which sort of shows them moving around and stuff. Whereas Emmy's heart rate was kind of like just a very steady, very flat line in a way. Not like flat lining as in dead, but it was it was not. Yeah, she wasn't moving, basically. So after a little while, um, it got to sort of like quarter past nine ish. So I'd almost been hooked up to the heart rate monitor for an hour. It was like coming up on an hour. Um, they still hadn't seen that sort of variation that they wanted to see. So they decided to contact the doctor who was on call. Um, so that was Dr. Dan, who I'd met a few times in passing. Um, and so they sent him some pictures of the ECG and asked for his thoughts. And uh, he called in and said, it didn't look quite right. And so he was going to come in and do an assessment. So about five, 10 minutes later, he arrived at the hospital. As I said, they're not there all the time, but they're on call. They'll be there within minutes if you need them. So Dr. Dan walks in. I'm like, hey, Dan. He's like, hey, Beth. Because um, when I went into hospital for gastro, if you guys <laughs> saw that community post, um, I had gastro at 35 weeks pregnant and I, it was so bad, I actually got hospitalized. Uh, Dr. Dan was the doctor working at that point, And so he'd actually met me then. So I, we, we sort of were like, oh yeah, you were the gastro girl. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do, you're Dr. Dan, whatever. So he walked in, he asked me some questions. He looked at the ECG. He was like, yeah, it's just not quite. And he repeated what the midwife had been saying basically about the variability. And so he called for a, an ultrasound machine to be brought in and he put the ultrasound on my belly. We found baby, there she was. We could see her heart rate like her heart flickering on the on the ultrasound but otherwise she was completely and utterly still. um it was extremely unnerving <laughs> to say the least i have had quite a few ultrasounds at this point in time throughout my two pregnancies and you know every other ultrasound i've ever had babies in there they're wriggling they're kicking even if they're sleeping they're like moving and they're like flailing around in there and she was just still still as a statue comatose in in the womb and it was at that point I think that both Dan and myself just went oh something's not right here um he asked me again you know have you felt any movement it, and I said no and he sort of went through the facts again I could it was like I could kind of see his brain like starting to kick into gear so we went through the facts again you know like when did you last feel movement or when did you know when did you notice that she wasn't moving have you tried turning to either side blah 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 so I answered all those questions, obviously, and then he decided to call for a second opinion from the second doctor on call, uh, Dr. Bryony, and see what she thought. But it was his feeling that baby girl may need, may be in trouble and may need to come out that night as soon as possible. So he went off to make his his second opinion phone call. I rang my husband <laughs> and I had I had been keeping him updated. So the first message said, Emmy's fine. Everything's fine. The second message I'd, I'd sent him was basically, actually, you know, they're a little concerned about the, the heart rate. So they're calling a doctor and he's going to come in. And then next thing I was calling him and I was like, Hey love. Um, so something's not quite right. They're calling for a second opinion, but 
it's possible that they may want to do an emergency cesarean tonight as soon as possible. And so my poor husband's like, oh, okay. I was like, yeah. So I'm, I'm going to see what the doctor says. If they want to operate, I'm going to need you to get to hospital sort of ASAP. And he was like, okay, what about Aiden, our son, who was obviously in bed at that point? I was like, I'll figure that out. Uh, maybe just can you, like, get a bag ready, put Emmy's bag in your car, you know, get some things ready because you might need to come up to a hospital uh, kind of really soon. <laughs> he was like, all right, no worries. Doctor came back in and said, yeah, my second opinion agrees with me. I think we should um, get this baby out tonight. I asked at that point if I might be able to, or if we might be able to consider an induction of labor rather than a cesarean section. And the reason for that was I really didn't want to have a C-section. <laughs> I really didn't. Um, I had given, I have given birth to a child before and I knew I could do it again. But the main thing with a C-section, you know, the, it's a major abdominal surgery and the recovery is very different from a C-section compared to a natural birth. I can say that now. I've had both. <laughs> and the, the two main things I was concerned about was, A, my son. I, w I knew that if I had a cesarean section, I would be facing six weeks of not being able to lift up my son. And B, um, just in general, I guess the recovery was a concern to me. I also knew that I would be not allowed to drive for four to six weeks after the cesarean as well, which is, I really love driving. So that was not ideal. Um, and I just was concerned about the recovery in general from having a major surgery. So I asked, you know, if there was any chance we might be able to induce labor rather than go the C-section route. And Dr. Dan agreed to examine me and he said, you know, if by some chance you're three centimeters dilated and about to go into labor, we could consider it. But honestly, my recommendation would still be cesarean because while we know that your body can do it, your body can give birth to a child and go through labor, we don't know at this point what's happening with your daughter and we don't know if she would be okay to go through labor. So he did examine me. I was like one centimeter dilated, not at all close to going into labor. And so next thing I knew, I was signing consent forms <laughs> to have a cesarean section. I called my parents and I was like, <laughs> it was so sad. So I, I tried calling mum, her phone was off. I called my dad and he was like, hi, Beth, because he was really excited because obviously there's only one reason that your pregnant daughter is going to be calling you at 10 o'clock at night on a Friday and it's probably going to be that she's going into labour, right? So he was really excited and I was kind of like, hi, dad, um, is mum awake still by any chance? Um, and mum heard him talking on the phone and got up and came in. And basically I asked if one of them could please drive to our house as soon as possible to, <laughs> to be present, a body in the house for my son, because my husband was going to have to come to hospital <laughs> as soon as possible. This was all happening very quickly. Um, as I said, it was around 10 o'clock-ish that I was making these phone calls. So this is an hour and a half after I'd gotten to the hospital. So mum was like, yep, absolutely. I'll pack my bag. I'll be at your house in 20 minutes. Don't even stress. I was like, great. Called my husband back. I was like, mum's on her way down. Can you leave as soon as possible? Because they are like assembling the team. They're prepping the theater. I'm going into surgery. Like they want to get me in there within half an hour, 45 minutes. And he was like, oh, okay, well, I can't leave Aiden. And I was like, maybe give it like 10 minutes and then leave. So, um, you know, mum would be halfway there <laughs> by the time he left because I was like, I need you to get here as soon as you can. So, yeah, at that point I got taken through to a room in maternity to wait um, for the team to be assembled. So, as I said, um, there's multiple doctors on call uh, at any point in time. So for this, they called in. Dan was already there. They called in the second, Bryony, and they also called in the third doctor on call, who, funnily enough, was my doctor, Dr. Julie, who, if you watched my first birth story uh, with Aiden, you will know the name Dr. Julie. She was my saviour. And uh, she's actually, yeah, she's been my doctor ongoing throughout this pregnancy. So I was really happy when she rocked up and came in to say hi. I was like, Julie! She's like, Beth, what's going on? And I'm like, I don't know. I'm having a cesarean. She was like, this is crazy. And I'm like, I know. Anyway. That was really nice. It was just really nice to have her there as like a familiar face. And it was really funny as well because on Monday that week, I'd actually had an appointment with Julie, just like a regular routine checkup. And when we'd looked at Emmy that day, she'd been her usual self. She'd been kicking and flipping and doing all sorts of crazy acrobatics inside the belly. So we were just like, what the heck's happened between Monday and now, you know, to, to make this necessary? I don't know, but 
anyway so um yeah around around 10 30 my husband arrived um we had about five minutes together to talk and then um someone came in to say uh theater was almost ready and they met they said hi to paul and gave him some scrubs to change into about 10 minutes after that um or five minutes after that maybe dr dan came in and said yep we're ready to go we're gonna wheel you down to theater now so I got down to theatre um, and they administered the spinal uh, anaesthetic, which was no big deal. Honestly, getting a spinal was fine. It was basically the same as getting an epidural, which I had uh, during my labour with my son, except easier this time because I wasn't having contractions while they were trying to stick a needle in my back. So that was easy. I was just like, oh, this is fine. I'll just, you know, hunch over and whatever. So I got my spinal. Um, they waited for that to take effect. The operating theatre was very bright, very clinical. It was like 11 o'clock ish at this point. Paul and I are sort of in complete shock at this point, just following instructions, just going along with the flow, overwhelmed by everything. So yeah, it was, it was, it was scary. I'm, I'm not gonna lie, but I was, I was just in survival mode at that point. Like I was just like, okay, tell me what to do this has to happen. I have no choice. So let's just, let's just do it. Okay. Whatever. Not going to think too much. I'm just going to do. That was sort of the phase, the, the state of mind I was in. So the, the spinal took effect. Um, they prepped me for surgery and they got started. Um, everything was fairly relaxed. I wouldn't say it was like an emergency cesarean where they were like, must get this baby out like right now, right now, right now. Like it was, it was not that intense. It was relatively relaxed, as I say. I think because her heart rate had been okay, they they were, yeah, they were not rushing as much as they could have been. So we were chatting and, you know, the doctor was telling me, you know, the, what they were doing and he was saying, you know, um, once we get her out, depending on how she is, we'll either, you know, hold her up and bring her around for you to cuddle or she will go straight to Julie. So Julie was on, on baby duty. Um, so uh, if, if Emmy was not happy and not well uh, when she came out, she would go straight to Julie for... Uh, for work and everything so yeah I was pretty much just there <laughs> hands spread on the table as they as they got to work I was joking with them that I really wanted her to be born that day because it was the first and then her birth date would be one one two two three first of the 12th 23 because that's how we say the date in Australia day month year <laughs> and so they were like oh we'll see what we can do you know it was so it was, it was fairly relaxed and so then they got to the point where you know they had opened me up and they were ready to start getting baby out. That was when things started to get a bit more intense, I think. And the mood in the room kind of changed somewhat. I had polyhydramnios again. So again, if you watched my first birth, you might be familiar with that. But basically I just had a lot of amniotic fluid, <laughs> like more than normal. And so they were suctioning all the fluid out and trying to get a hold of, of my baby and, and get her out. And they were having uh, some real trouble doing that. <laughs> So she wasn't in a good position. She was too high up. There was so much fluid. It was a lot. So the way that the spinal works, uh, the best thing I can liken it to is if you've ever had dental work done where they've used local anesthetic on your on your mouth and you can, you can you know, like sense that people are doing things and pulling teeth and, and prodding and, and whatever, but you can't feel any pain. It's the same with a cesarean. So it was like, all sensation is there. So pushing, pulling, wiggling, prodding, you know, you can tell things are happening, but there's no pain whatsoever. So when they were having trouble getting Emmy out, you know, they started saying, oh, there's, you're going to feel pressure, you're going to feel pushing, you're going to feel prodding. Um, and then it's it really got quite intense there. Um, I don't know how long they were working on trying to get her out. It felt like maybe 10, 15 minutes. And it, yeah, they were really pushing like on my ribs and on my upper belly to try to get her down, try to get a hold of her and, and get her out. I could tell when they were getting close because there was two people holding up the, the curtain and they sort of started to roll the curtain down in preparation. And they said to Paul, you know, get your phone ready. She's about to come out, take some pictures. And so Paul was sort of there with his phone ready to go. And then we heard Dr. Dan say, nope, not happy. And the curtain went back up and Paul had to put his phone back down and she got handed straight off to Dr. Julie. Now I'm getting emotional. Don't cry. So this is where, um, this is where things started to get hard. Um, obviously we knew that she'd come out 
and it, and Dan even said, you know, she's born, guys, she's born, she's out, but she's not happy. In that situation, <laughs> the first thing that you want to hear as a new parent is a cry from your, your from your newly born child. A cry is very reassuring. A cry is like, yep, my baby's there, they're breathing, they're making noise, they're happy, they're good. It was silent. We didn't hear a thing. They, they, as I said, they gave her straight to Dr. Julie, who was working on her, trying to stimulate her. Um, it was just silent. Uh, my husband and I were just there, just straining our ears. At least I was. I don't know why he was. But I was just straining my ears to try to pick up any noise um, from, from her or any any chatter from the doctors to try to hear what was going on. It was absolutely terrifying. <laughs> uh, eventually I, I heard someone say she's breathing and then I heard some very soft sort of like moans um, or, or whimpers um, from Emmy. Eventually then Dr. Julie said, she's okay, Beth, she's okay, she's breathing. Is going to be fine or you can come over and have a look take some photos she's just needing a little bit of support right now so paul went over to take some photos and this was the first photo that we had of little emmy uh, with a big oxygen mask on just helping her take her first breaths she still hadn't cried but she was okay um paul came back over to show me the the photos and they said that they were going to bring her around so i could see her but then they were going to take her straight down to their their essentially ICU neonatal uh, room. So as I said, uh, my hospital is a rural hospital. It's not particularly well equipped for dealing with babies who need help um, after birth. They have, you know, a room with a couple of neonatal cubes where they can put a baby and stabilize them, but um, it's not like a, it's not a, a specialist hospital for, for babies who are not doing well. So keep that in mind as we continue with the story. But um, yeah, they said they were going to take her down there, but they would bring her around to see me. So they brought her around. I got to say hello. Um, she opened her eyes and moaned when I spoke to her and everyone got very excited about that. Everyone was like, oh, she knows you. She knows your voice. I was like, yeah. I know I'm her mother basically I just got to yeah say hello give her a kiss on the forehead they said that Paul my husband could go with them so he looked at me and he was like should I go I was like yes go 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 make sure she's okay I'll be fine you know like at that point I'm just lying on the table while they start to put me back together and stitch me back up like there's nothing I can do I can't be with her you go be with her please so he went with them um and then he came back a few minutes later um, with some more photos and a little video of little Emmy and she was okay which was incredibly reassuring um, and when Paul came back he was certainly in a much happier state of mind. I did forget to say that when when we were waiting to, to hear something um, to know that our daughter was alive um, Paul did start to cry. I started to cry. <laughs> it was it was horrible um, but yeah he came back in a much a much happier, much more positive state of mind, I think. Like, you know, here's your photos, here's some videos, here's our daughter, she's going to be okay, she's going to be all right. So that was, yeah. And then, so we just sort of hung out while the doctors finished, you know, stitching me up, putting me back together and all of that kind of good thing. Dr. Dan was sort of chatting to me and we were just talking about how sudden and crazy everything had been and he pretty much said to me, you know, thank goodness you came in because if you hadn't, well, his exact words were, you probably saved your daughter's life by coming in tonight, which is just a terrifying thing to hear as a parent. Um, but yeah, if I, if I hadn't gone to hospital, there's a very good chance my daughter would have died uh, inside the womb. So let that be a very <laughs> good lesson, I guess, to anyone late in pregnancy. If you do notice reduced fetal movements if you do notice that your baby is not moving as much as they usually do go to the hospital seriously go and get checked out don't be like me freaking out that you're going to be a pest go and get checked but yeah so they finished up the surgery and i was taken through to recovery uh, which was just like a little ante room where they would just monitor me for another 45 minutes or so they wanted to make sure the the spinal was wearing off i was regaining sensation i was regaining movement in my legs you know they were doing my blood pressure every 10 minutes just making sure that i was okay that that period of time uh was probably the second 
artist period of time throughout this whole experience just with not being next to my child <laughs> felt really bizarre and weird with my son when he was born while I had a very difficult labor the moment he came out everything was fine and we were together instantly and to not be with my newborn child in that period of time was just it was horrible like it was horrible I just wanted her next to me I wanted her on my chest I wanted to snuggle her to try feeding her and it just felt like a piece of me had literally been taken out and taken off down the hallway and I wanted it back. <laughs> I was like, I need my daughter. I, I want my daughter right now, please. But I had to wait. The doctor, Dr. Dan was coming in to let me know how things were going with Emmy and they had taken some blood and run some tests on it and she was severely hypoglycemic. Her blood sugar was 0.9. Uh, a healthy blood sugar is... 2.6 at a minimum so she was like very 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 low on sugar they kept asking me like did you have gestational diabetes I was like no I didn't <laughs> they tested me and I was fine <laughs> so for some reason uh it seems like something had just gotten messed up in there and she wasn't getting the nutrients and the oxygen that she needed and that was what went wrong I I still don't know anything more than that they told me that you know they would run some tests but basically we might never know we might never get an answer as to what exactly went wrong with my baby girl and that's yeah that's been our reality we we just we don't know what happened we don't know why something went wrong we don't know what went wrong all we know is that she was near comatose when she was born and yeah would have died if if I hadn't gone so they, yeah, they ran some blood tests. The the blood sugar was really low. There were a couple other markers that were not quite right. Um, so they wanted to try giving her a little bit of like uh, sugar, basically. But she wasn't interested in sucking. Um, they wanted to try giving her some formula. She wasn't taking it. So they asked me if they could insert an, a neonasal, is that the word? Neonasal gastric feeding tube thing. I can't remember if that's the word, but yeah, a feeding tube in her nose, essentially, um, so they could get some some sugar in her, and I said, yep, go ahead. They got her to take, yeah, some some sugar, re-ran her bloods, and the, her blood sugars had come up. At that point, I was finally done being observed, so they took me down back into maternity, and I got to go into the little room where she was in my bed. <laughs> she was in a full neonatal cube at that point, um, so I was able to at least touch her. <laughs> I could put my arm through the hole in the side of the box and put my hand on her leg and say hello uh but otherwise she was yeah she was just they were trying to stabilize her basically so I was taken back to my room on the maternity ward and left to sort of recover Paul pulled out the the fold-out couch and, and tried to get some sleep I couldn't sleep obviously <laughs> um I was just lying there on my phone in agony pretty much not like not physical agony but like mental and emotional agony um I could hear a baby crying like next door in the room next door to mine and I thought it was Emmy I thought it was my daughter crying but it was just as I said it felt so unnatural to to not have her with me and to not be in the same room as her the, the nurses and, and the doctor were coming in every so often to continue to check on me and also to give me updates on how Emmy was going. Basically, Dr. Dan was on the phone a lot um, to specialists in, in neonatal care, getting advice, getting, you know, results back and forth. And, and um, he came in at about three-ish and said that he was trying to stabilise everything and basically trying to get things to a point where Emmy and I would be able to stay at our hospital. As I said before, our hospital was not, it's not kitted out with a full-time neonatal ward. So if she required like a lot of ongoing special care, we were going to have to be transferred to a hospital down in Adelaide. And so Dr. Dan basically came in and said, I'm trying not to let that happen. <laughs> but it is a possibility that you may have to go down the hill. Uh, we, we say down the hill, sorry, from, from the Adelaide Hills down into town. Um, yeah, he, he said there is a possibility you may have to go down the hill 
Uh, he came back in at about 4.30, woke us up, woke my poor husband up, turned the lights on and said, I'm really sorry, guys. They want to send you down to Adelaide. And I was devastated <laughs> because I love my hospital. Um, it's, it's such a beautiful hospital. The midwife team is amazing. The doctors are incredible. And because it's a rural hospital, the, the care that you receive there is so personalised. So I really, and, and obviously it's so much closer to home, I really didn't want to be transferred, but there was nothing we could do. Um, he said, yeah, the, the, basically the specialist, the neonatal specialist in the state, I've been on the phone to them and they've said, yeah, that Emmy go to either the Women's and Children's Hospital in Adelaide or the Flinders Medical Centre in Adelaide, um, two big hospitals that we have that both have full-time, full like, well-staffed, kitted out neonatal care wards. So at that point, he wasn't sure which hospital it was going to be, um, but they were in the process of basically sorting all that out, organising transport. Um, and so at an hour or so, hour and a half later, it was close to, yeah, close 5.30, close to 6 a.m., um, we were told we were going to Flinders Hospital in Adelaide and uh, an ambulance was there for me and a specialist infant uh, transport company called MedStar had been called to transport Emmy. Unfortunately, we were not able to go together because I was bedridden and I couldn't get up. So I wasn't able to sit in the car with or sit in the back of the van with Emmy and um, she wasn't able to come with me. We had to go separately. Um, my husband was given the option of going down with either of us or following us down in his car. I actually told him at that point to go home. <laughs> I was like, lovey, you are exhausted. This has been insane. And I think you should go home, get a few good hours of sleep and then come down and see me a bit later today. I don't think there's any point in you coming down now. You know, like we're going to be taken down there. We're going to be stabilized. We're going to be admitted. I'm going to try to sleep a bit. And then maybe later, you know, I might, might actually be able to go see Emmy. So you, you go home and sleep. And Paul was like, okay, that sounds like a good idea. <laughs> I didn't want him driving down to Adelaide. He was exhausted. He was still sick. I was like, yeah, go home and I'll see you later. So they loaded me into the back of the ambulance um, and down we went. It was an extremely uncomfortable drive, not going to lie, particularly when we went over a railway uh, in, in Adelaide. That was ouch. The back of an ambulance, as it turns out, is not the smoothest ride. And uh, having just had a cesarean section, yeah, painful. So thus began our stay at Flinders Hospital. Um, so day one was, I, it, I was pretty out of it. I'm not going to lie. I started off by sleeping about an hour and a half from about 7 till 8.30-ish. I asked to go down and see Emmy as soon as possible. Um, and I got down there... Oh, sorry. So I was I was in a room in a maternity ward upstairs on the fourth floor, and then Emmy was on the third floor in a specialist care neonatal room, uh, which was staffed full time by neonatal nurse. So when I say I went down to see Emmy, that's what I mean. Went down to see Emmy that day at about nine thirty a.m. Got wheeled down in my bed because I was still bedridden, and that was the first point that I actually got to hold her. She was hooked up to, obviously, uh, an IV. Um, she'd been hooked up to IV glucose and antibiotics. Um, she had heart rate monitoring on. She had her neonasal tube in. So there was all sorts of craziness going on with my poor little child. <laughs> tubes tubes and wires everywhere. But I finally got to hold her and we got to have a go at breastfeeding. Um, I was really concerned about breastfeeding. Um, with my son, obviously, he was born, he was put on my chest. We tried breastfeeding within the first hour of him being alive. With Emmy, at this point, it's been 10 hours since she was born. I had done some expressing of milk to try to, like, tell my body, hey, you've had your baby, she's no longer inside you, you need to start producing the milkies, let's go. But, yeah, so we had to go at breastfeeding. It was okay, but it was really difficult considering I was laying reclined in a bed and I couldn't really sit up and I couldn't really maneuver her into a good position to feed and yeah, but I did get to hold her at least, give her a cuddle. And I was down there for a little while, went back up to my room. Uh, my husband and my mum and my son arrived to see us at about midday. We went back down and saw Emmy again. They stayed for a few hours. 
about 4.35 o'clock, uh, one of the nurses came in to check on me, do observations, and suggest that it might be time for me to try getting out of bed, which was probably a good call. I still had my catheter in at that point, so she took out my catheter and helped me very, very, very slowly and gingerly try to get up from the bed. Zero out of ten, do not recommend. <laughs> um, but I did manage to get up and get on my feet. I was my spinal had completely worn off, obviously, by that point, but it was just I was just had major surgery so it's a bit sore the midwife said hey do you want to try taking a shower and I was like yes I would love to try taking a shower I went into the bathroom to do that happily showering away and then my vision started going a bit funny there were kind of like bright white squiggles and lines and dots everywhere uh, I realized something was not quite right. I was sort of holding onto the rail in the shower going like, I don't feel so good. I pressed the call button. Good job me. Pressed the call button that was right next to me. And then the next thing I remember, I was waking up on the floor of the shower um, as the midwife opened the door and went <gasps> and ran in and pressed the emergency button. And all these people came in flooding into the bathroom where I was naked, fainted on the floor in the shower. You got no dignity in a hospital, do you? Um, so, yeah, I'd passed out, which apparently can happen. I'd had a massive blood pressure drop. Oopsie. Uh, I went back to bed. They told me not to try getting up again until tomorrow. Uh, so that night was a bit difficult. Um, I was going down to the neonatal ward every four hours or so to feed my daughter. And there were people coming in to do observations on me every hour after I fainted. So I didn't get much sleep. <laughs> Needless to say, um, I think I got one good chunk of sleep between about 3am and 6am, roughly. Day two was more of the same, except I did manage to successfully get out of bed and take a shower. Um, I had more visitors that day. I was able to get myself in and out of a wheelchair that day. So that was easier than the bed by far, particularly for feeding Emmy. Day three was I was able to walk. Um, and at that point, this was the, the Monday. This was when I started to get a little nervous about when I would be sent home. So Emmy had been hooked up, as I said, to IV fluids, uh, glucose and... Uh, antibiotics. She was almost finished with her course of antibiotics. They told me that it was a 48 hour course, but the, the glucose, basically they, they'd hooked her up to like a certain amount per hour. So they'd hooked her up initially to 10 milligrams per hour and they were trying to wean it. They were trying to cut it down and testing her blood every couple of hours to see how she was handling it. Because basically in order to be able to go home, she had to be healthy and not and stabilizing her own blood sugars. She had to be um, off her antibiotics. She had to be pooing and weeing and eating and all those things. But it sort of on day three, it was looking like she wasn't really making a lot of great progress with her blood sugars. Um, and I kind of knew that it was likely that they were going to want to send me home. <laughs> in Australia, it's standard to stay in hospital three to five days after a cesarean section, depending on obviously like how it went um, and your your own recovery. So, so I was talking to different people, basically. Anyone I could, I was talking to about, you know, how long are they going to let me stay? When are they going to send me home? Will I be able to stay until my daughter is ready to go home too? Like, how is this going to work? So everyone that I was speaking to was kind of saying, oh, don't even worry. We're going to do our absolute best to, you know, keep you here until your daughter's ready to go, especially, you know, if she's close to being ready to go home um, and you just need to stay for one extra night. Like, we'll do our best to get you in for that extra night. They were saying, you know, like sometimes there's a lot of bed pressure where they really have to try to move people out quickly to to free up the beds for other people. But they were saying, like, there's not a lot of bed pressure right now, so you should be fine. I wouldn't worry. We'll, we'll really do our best to to like, yeah, to cater for you. Then that afternoon, Monday afternoon, 
I was back in my room having my lunch and a midwife came in, a nurse came in to uh, do some observations on me, give me some medicines. And then she's like, oh, and I've got all your discharge paperwork ready to go. And I was like, eh, my what? And they were like, oh, hasn't anyone told you you're going home this afternoon? No. No, no one, no one has told me that I'm going home this afternoon. What do you mean? No, I can't go home yet. I'm sorry. No. That was, that was probably like the third worst moment, honestly, of this whole ordeal was that moment right then when they tried to discharge me. I was like, I can't. No, I'm not leaving. My daughter's still downstairs. She needs like one more day, maybe two. I, I no one has told me anything about this. What do you mean? They want me to go home within a matter of hours. And she was like, yeah, uh, have you got, so have you got transport, you know, to get back home? And I'm like, no, obviously I don't have transport to get back home. What, what? So this, um, this lovely nurse, God bless her. She was actually from the same town as me because she'd noticed on my paperwork. She's like, Hey, we live in the same town. God bless her. She saw, I think my reaction and the fear in my eyes she said, give me a minute. And she went back out of my room for a couple of minutes, came back in about 10 minutes later. And she was like, I've got you in for another night. I've just fiddled around with some paperwork. You're okay. Don't stress. <laughs> I was like, lady, <laughs> what do you mean? Oh my God. So she did say to me, you know, I've got you in for one more night, but you're going to have to figure something else out for if your daughter needs to stay another night, I don't think I'm going to be able to do anything for you. I was like, okay. I went downstairs to neonatal and I said to the midwives down there or the nurses down there, I was like, so hypothetically, what happens if they want to kick me out upstairs and uh, I live an hour away and I would really prefer to not go home without my daughter. And so they basically said to me that they had some rooms available downstairs on the neonatal floor which were reserved for breastfeeding mamas with babies in neonatal care to sleep in for a night or two so they said they're hard to get you know they're they're very highly contested but you would be a prime candidate for one because you are breastfeeding you want to exclusively breastfeed your baby and Emmy's close she is close to being able like re being ready to go home so don't stress. You've got your astronaut upstairs. Come back down tomorrow morning and we'll sort something out. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so that was day three in the hospital. Day four was, um, was the Tuesday. And that day, that day I was really, really hopeful that we were going to be able to go home. By that stage, I had kind of really like worked out how the hospital ran and how things worked. And so I knew that the doctors on the neonatal floor were going to be in my daughter's neonatal room at around nine doing their rounds. And that if I could be there at nine, I would be able to talk to the doctors <laughs> and get their updates and express my desires to be discharged and to go home. I had been there the Monday as well to speak to the doctors and uh, I had encouraged them to move things along and to try getting Emmy off of her IVs and everything, which they had done, bless them. So yeah, Tuesday morning rolls around, Emmy's off all her monitoring apart from she just had like one wire hooked up to her ankle or her foot monitoring her blood oxygen levels. She'd been taken out of her big infant neonatal cube. She was just in an open air cot. She was feeding well, happy as a clam. I'm thinking like, this is all going to work out. This is going to be great. We're going to be able to go home today. Sky high hopes. Um, the doctors come in, do their rounds, look at Emmy and go, gee, she's a bit yellow. <laughs> I'm like, yes, she has some jaundice. They're like, she's glowing, Beth. You can see her glow from the other side of the room. And I was like, oh, God. Yeah. So her blood sugars had stabilized. Her IV antibiotics were done. Her heart rate was happy. She was breathing happy, feeding happy, but she was very, very jaundiced. So they said, she's going to need phototherapy. And I said, okay, how much the phototherapy? How long are we talking? What's the deal? They said, probably 24 hours. <laughs> My God. <laughs> okay, sure. 
So the doctor, bless him, his name was David, I think. He was so lovely. Um, I really can't fault this man. He was very kind, very understanding. He knew how much I wanted to go home and he knew how much I did not want to go home without my daughter. So he basically was like, yeah, look, she's, she needs phototherapy, but you are a breastfeeding mum. Okay, you need to stay. What are they doing with you upstairs? And I was like, yeah, they want to discharge me today. Like, there's no way I'm going to be able to stay another night upstairs. He said, okay. He called the head neonatal nurse who was running the show downstairs. He said, I've got Amelia. I've got Bethany. She needs a bed for the night. Can we give her one? And the head neonatal nurse lady went, sure, she can have a bed in room 23. And I was like, really? (laughs) And they were like, yep no worries. Uh, you, you, you have a space to sleep tonight. Yes. Great. Okay. Um, so Emmy was put in what they call a UV cocoon. It was very cute. She had these cute little goggles, um, and basically was just wrapped up in UV lights for the next 24 hours. Um, I was moved downstairs to my, my little room. I didn't actually have a bed. I had a fold out couch, which was extremely uncomfortable I will not lie it was not an ideal environment for sleeping but the best thing about that day and that night was that when I was moved down to that room they moved Emmy in there with me so finally or four days after she'd been born I was actually able to sleep next to my daughter and be with her so she was on in her little UV cocoon I was on my little fold-out sofa we spent a night. I left her in that cocoon as much as I possibly could, trying to give the, the phototherapy all the time it needed to work. And then that was Tuesday. Wednesday rolls around. Once again, I'm there. I'm ready. I'm dressed, waiting for the doctors to come round. Because I'd been moved um, into a different room, I did unfortunately have to wait a lot longer to see the doctors. Instead of them coming by at around 9 a.m., they came around at like 12 <laughs> Um, so that, oh, there's my daughter. Okay, we're back. (laughs) And we've got the baby. (laughs) She just had a feed. I promise the story's almost done. This video is ridiculously long at this point in time. I did warn you it was a bit of a story, didn't I? So where were we? Yeah, so it was midday before the doctors actually got round to our room (laughs) to to say hello and check on, on me. She had had some more blood tests done to check on her jaundice levels that morning at around 10. Uh, and I knew that the results had come back and that her, her bilirubin levels uh, or her, jo- her jaundice levels had dropped dramatically and were, in, were now within a very healthy and normal range. So I was cautiously optimistic that day that we might actually be allowed to go home. I wasn't going to get my hopes as high as they had been the day before because I don't, didn't think I could bear to be disappointed again. But Dr. David was working again and he walked in and he said, hello, how are you? And I was like, oh really like to go home (laughs) he was like yeah I know I think you should be able to um so he looked at everything he looked at her results um it took her out of her UV cocoon and she had gotten nicely pink again rather than yellow all over her body um and her as I said her bilirubin levels had come down so he said I think you guys are good to go he did a big sort of newborn examination on her to, you know, check her hips, her reflexes, her responses and everything, and everything was fine. And I was told to call my husband and, uh, yeah, get ourselves, get ourselves home. So all in all, you know, the hospital stay, it, it's so funny because it was so short, but it felt like an eternity and it it exists in my memory almost like outside of time. It's like every hour just felt so intense and every day felt so intense. It was like this big race against the clock, you know, firstly, because I knew they were probably going to want to send me home before Emmy was ready to go home. So the whole time I was there, I was so stressed about, you know, Emmy getting well and and getting off her IVs and, and it was just such an intense time and the room that she was in for the for the few days in a row it was just heartbreaking because there was like four or five other babies in there and most of those other babies were like super premature babies you know born around 31 32 weeks gestation and they were going to be in there for a long time and I met you know 
most of the parents of those babies and I met, you know, I got to know their stories and this was just one of the rooms in the neonatal ward at Flinders and I just want to say that if you are a mum who had a baby in special care, in neonatal care for weeks and weeks and weeks, I just admire you so much and I'm so sorry because that must have been so hard. Uh, five days for me just felt like an absolute eternity and I don't know if it was because I knew that she wasn't that unwell and I knew that you know we just had to figure out these couple of things and then we'd be able to go home versus you know like a a baby who was born 10 weeks early I you know I feel like with that you'd probably just have to accept like okay it's she's going to be in there for a long long time I don't know if that made it harder or easier or, or what but I just want to say that it was such a it was such a difficult time and being separated from Emmy for those first couple of hours and those first couple of days was honestly just horrible and and so unnatural feeling and especially for me because my experience with Aiden was so different and in comparison so run of the mill and perfect <laughs> um this experience was just awful because it was so different and it felt so wrong in so many ways like like as a new mum for me at least it it's like you just want to be with your baby you you want to care for your baby you want to hold your baby you want to feed your baby you want to you want to be there with them and for them and to not be able to do that was horrendous honestly horrendous so as I said if you are a mum who has been through an a neonatal stay of a few days or many many weeks my heart goes out to you because I get it <laughs> I get it now and it's horrible and I know that I got pretty lucky and I know that we could have been there for a lot longer um you know, Emmy really only had the blood sugar thing that we really needed to figure out and then the jaundice and then we were good to go and it could have been so much worse. And even though she was born, uh, in in the words of the doctors, dazed and floppy, um, she was still born alive <laughs> and you know, didn't require oxygen for more than a couple of hours really and she was okay and she could have been a lot worse. So I'm very thankful for that. But it was definitely harrowing at times, uh, this whole experience. And obviously I did have to have a C-section. So our recovery has been, I think, I think honestly my recovery is going pretty well. But as anticipated, it absolutely sucks <laughs> having a 17, almost 18 month toddler who I can't pick up. Uh, it sucks. It really sucks. I've had so much help and I'm so grateful. Um, my mum has been here pretty much every single day. My mother-in-law has been here as much as she could as well. Unfortunately, we did get COVID. Uh, so a couple of days after we got home from the hospital, my son started displaying some symptoms of he was just, you could tell he wasn't well. He had a minor fever. He was a bit low energy. He was a bit floppy. We were we weren't super concerned. We thought maybe he just had like a mild cold. That was on I think the Saturday after I got home. So I got home the Wednesday. Yeah, I think it was the the maybe even the Friday. He wasn't well. Yeah, so we all thought not much of it. We all thought it was a minor cold. And then on the following Monday, suddenly all of us adults were sick. My mum went home to take care of some things at her house. Started feeling really sick. Did a COVID test, and sure enough, had COVID. Then I did a COVID test, and sure enough, I had COVID too. So we all had COVID, uh, which was not not what we needed, not what we wanted. Thanks, universe, but it wasn't too bad. So I had, this was the second time I'd had COVID this year. The first time was back in February, and the, the time we had it in February was way worse. We were so much sicker. But yeah, so the recovery has been... It's been fine. It's just been very frustrating for me personally um, to not be able to take proper care of my son has felt really hard. My mum, as I said, has been doing an absolutely incredible job. But now it's gotten to the point where my son is like preferring her to me because <laughs> he knows that I can't pick him up. So if he wants to be picked up, he will go to her. Um, if I come near him to give him a, a cuddle, he'll shake his head because he knows mummy can't hold him. Um, 
really, really devastating. Really devastating. And uh, it's only been two and a half weeks, so we've still got another sort of three weeks or so where I really need to, to not pick him up. But yeah, so that uh, that's pretty much it. That's that's the story of of uh, this little girl's birth so far. It it was not at all what I had been expecting or preparing for. It was a complete shock. Three and a half hours, you know, between me getting to the hospital thinking something might be wrong and her being born. And it's definitely going to take some time <laughs> to to fully process all the emotions and probably a fair bit of therapy. <laughs> I I had my therapist on speed dial for the whole time I was there. She was amazing. She called me um, a couple of times just to check in and see how I was going. She didn't charge me for it or anything. She was just like, because I sent her an email and I was like, oh yeah, so Emmy's here and uh, this is what happened. And yeah, she called me the next day. She's like, are you okay? Tell me everything. What happened? So my therapist has been amazing and I'll, yeah, I'll definitely go back and continue to see her in the new year. But, um, yeah, it was, it was, it was horrifying. Um, I'm so grateful that she's here and she's well. Uh, we are continuing to deal with jaundice. Um, I, we had her two week doctor checkup visit today. Uh, we would have gone sooner, but unfortunately because of COVID, we had to wait a little bit extra. So we had her check up today. They said she's still a bit yellow. So uh, we actually do have to take her into hospital in Adelaide uh, within the next day or two for some more blood tests just to check on her levels and see how everything's going. So we're still, yeah, we're still sort of managing everything. She sleeps great for a newborn I will say she feeds really well we did manage to establish a really good healthy breastfeeding relationship which was honestly a huge relief after the start that we had she is a very settled very happy very content little baby she only cries if she's got a pooey nappy or if she's starving hungry that's pretty much it um Aiden loves her (laughs) it's very cute uh we he knows who baby sister is we call her baby sissy and um, he'll come up and sort of give her a little kiss or pat her head or give her a little cuddle. Um, he does constantly try to steal her dummies or her blankets because uh, they're nice and soft and he loves a soft blankie. So we do have to monitor that. And obviously he is still an 18-month-old, so he doesn't quite know his own strength. <laughs> so we do have to make sure he's being very gentle with her and we can't, you know, leave him near her un- unsupervised, obviously. But in general, they're doing really well together. And it's very cute and uh yeah i'm i'm okay um i will be on maternity leave most likely for the next little while um i can't see myself being able to come back to youtube uh anytime soon in a uh consistent fashion <laughs> shall we say i would like to resume making videos for you all in the new year i'm in the process of sorting out we may be sending Aiden to childcare a couple days a week next year. So if that is the case, then I might use those days to see if I can get some YouTube work done. You right, lovey? Yeah, so we'll, we'll see. But I, I envision it being quite a few months um, before I'm really back in any sort of yeah consistent fashion here on the channel. And that is simply because I just... You know, I have my hands full <laughs> and I want to, I want to be there for my kids. Um, I had, I have a lot of healing to do physically, emotionally. I, I have a lot of fitness that I would like to, to regain a lot of uh, strength, flexibility, a lot of weight to lose. Um, so that's going to be a big focus for me over the next year and um, raising my, my sweet babies. So if you are a mum who has had a similar experience, leave me a comment. Let me know uh, what was it like for you? <laughs> How long does it take to get over the disappointment of, of and the trauma of, of a birth like that? Um, I am disappointed. I know it's I know it's a bit strange, but I feel like in a way I've been grieving the the birth that I didn't get to have. I was actually in a very weird sort of way, kind of looking forward to to going into labor a second time and, and having another baby and, and seeing what it was like. And I was just, you know, I had no concept. I had no expectation of, of what happened happening. Um, 
yeah, as far as I was concerned, everything was just going to be fine. As I said, still processing. <laughs> it's still processing. I've been doing a lot of journaling. Um, I'm a big journaler and that's been really, really helpful for me just to sort out my thoughts and my feelings. And I've actually got my journal here next to me because I spent a whole afternoon in the hospital on the Tuesday just writing down absolutely everything that had happened. So I um, highly recommend journaling. If you're not a journaler, give it a go. It's very therapeutic. <laughs> but yeah, so are you laughing? What are you laughing at? She's laughing in her sleep. For now, guys, I'm going to go. I am going to go and actually pay some attention to my mother-in-law who is looking after my son right now. <laughs> I've kind of been up here for the last hour and a half. But yeah, um, I will definitely be around on Discord, on my Discord. If you're part of that community, don't worry, I'm going to be around. Um, I'll still be posting on Patreon for you Patreon supporters when I can. Um, I am hoping to get back to live streaming within the next couple of months just depending on how things go that really depends on my husband because if i'm live streaming he has to be with the kids so it'll be a matter of when he feels comfortable having emmy and aiden at the same time for three hours at a time uh that'll be that'll be when i come back to streaming but hopefully that'll be some point in january no promises obviously but um yeah, fingers crossed that'll be something I can do before too long. But anyway, guys, for now, take care, everyone. Um, I wish you all the best. I wish you a very, very Merry Christmas and a very Happy New Year. Uh, if that's something that you celebrate, if you don't, then I hope you just enjoy the holidays. Um, and I will see you when I'm looking at you. All right, everyone. Take care. Bye for now.